One of the things that I appreciate is that um, there's just so much depth of theology, so much, so much of our training and instruction in the Word of God can happen through music. I had a good friend, some good friends of mine. Uh, he was the worship pastor at Salem First Baptist for a number of years, and I being a young man who was wanting to go into the ministry looking for pastoring positions, I asked him, well, what are some tips that you would give to somebody who was going to supervise a worship team and how do you see your role as a worship pastor? And he made an observation that I thought was very interesting. He said he saw his role as a worship pastor as discipling through music. And so that's one of the things that as I see us singing together, something that's a, an important value to me and I pray would be an important value to you as well, is to learn to be instructed in the Word of God and in sound doctrine, sound teaching through music. And so I appreciate the worship team and all of the efforts that go into choosing the songs and I really believe that they are picking up on that, uh, on that desire. So there's, what happens in terms of teaching is more than just what I do here, and it's what happens there, so I appreciate the worship team on that. So everybody likes a good story. I think that's pretty safe to say. Nearly every generation has had some story going back to the beginning of time that communicates truth. And we like to communicate that good stories capture the imagination. They draw us in and they hold our attention. They help us to understand things in perhaps ways that we might not other, otherwise be able to grasp. A good story captures joys and sorrows. It captures highs and lows. It captures comedy and drama. And they also include the great and the small, villains and heroes. Personally, I like stories that are more plot-driven than action-driven, and ones that really communicate some good points. Perhaps one of the greatest stories written in the 20th century is J.R.R. Tolkien's trilogy, The Lord of the Rings. How many are familiar with The Lord of the Rings? So I've got some people who are familiar with that here. So for those who are unfamiliar with it, Tolkien was a professor at Oxford University, and he was actually a friend and colleague of C.S. Lewis. He writes the story, this trilogy was actually originally supposed to be a single volume. For those who may have read it, that single volume would have been about that thick. But it's a story of this magical ring that was created in the fires of Mount Doom. One of a myriad of rings, but this particular ring was the one that controlled the power of the other rings. It was powerful, capable of influencing those who possess it into thinking that they can control the power of this ring. And yet, those who possess this ring would find their hearts easily corrupted and it would ultimately lead to their destruction. This story involves wizards and elves, dwarves and orcs and humans, and then the most unlikely and simplest of creatures, hobbits. The Wikipedia article on hobbits says that Tolkien describes hobbits as being between two feet and three feet tall, the average height being three feet six inches. They dress in bright colors favoring yellow and green. They are usually shy, but are nevertheless capable of great courage and amazing feats under the proper circumstances. While there may be many candidates for the hero of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Frodo carries the ring to be destroyed, Aragorn is the heir to the throne of Gondor, 
or the wizard Gandalf who provides counsel to those who are seeking to stand against the evil Sauron. In my opinion, the unsung hero of the tale is the simple hobbit Samwise Gamgee. Sam is, a, is the consummate friend. He is unwaveringly loyal to Frodo. He is uncomplicated and simple. He is brave and dedicated to the mission that has to be accomplished. Not only does he understand what they need to do, but he understands why they need to do it. At the end of each of the three films, it's Sam, not Frodo, that keeps the mission going. This morning, I want to turn our attention to the characteristics of faith that are exhibited in this unlikely of people, as we see in 1 John. My text this morning is 1 John chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. 1 John chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Chapter 2, excuse me, thank you. Thank you, I've got the tech team keeping me in line back there. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. This is what John writes. He says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the truths embedded in it. I thank you for the realities of what you desire for us to know. Lord, I thank you that what we've been handed comes from real people written to others who are real people in real times and in real places to communicate real truth to us that we do not stand on fables, on fairy tales, but we stand on the very truth of the Word of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand from your Word this morning what you desire for us to know about our faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as you look at the text, you'll notice that there are three different groups that John appears to be addressing here. As John writes, he's writing to children, to fathers, and to young men. Now, it's possible that John is talking about three very different chronological groups here. He could be talking in part to little children, biologically, to fathers biologically, or to young men biologically. Let me submit to you that there may be also something else going on here. That John is describing here three different qualities that should be common to all believers. Qualities that are certain characteristics of faith. These qualities can be, be summed up in what, for the sake of this sermon this morning, I'm referring to as a Samwise faith. A Samwise faith is one that is simple, mature, and courageous. First thing we understand from our text this morning is that a Samwise faith is a simple faith, recognizing the work of the Father. John states twice as he writes here, he is writing to little children or to children. This is a common term of endearment. 
that John uses. It's something that is also written in John 18, 17, that describes how somebody receives the gospel. Jesus says in Luke, excuse me, Luke 18, 17, Luke 18, 17, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. It's a faith that is childlike, but not childish. It is simple, but not simplistic. It does not complicate itself with things that are unnecessary or distracting from its proper focus. It's uncomplicated, accepting the truth of God for what it is. So what does this text tell us about this simple faith? It tells us two things. First of all, the, those with simple faith know that they have been forgiven. So your grammar lesson for this Sunday, Paul writes, he says, I write to you little children because you have been forgiven for his name's sake. So what tense is he using here? The tense he is using here is what's called the perfect tense. It refers to an action that has been completed in the past, but has ongoing effects. It's one that has been done, but the impact of what has been done carries on. Those with simple faith understand that they have been forgiven of their sins. They don't wrestle with that. They know that they have been forgiven for his name's sake. We'll get to that here in a second. When you understand that you are in Christ, you realize the power of sin over you has been broken. John writes in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So often this verse gets used in a salvation sense to unbelievers, but John is writing to believers here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those who have this simple faith, understand that they have been forgiven. Confession reconciles us to God, and the simple faith understands this. The simple faith understands that we have been forgiven, and therefore we are reconciled to God. John makes another point. He says that your sins have been forgiven for your sake? No. For his name's sake, God did not look down from heaven and seek out those who were almost good enough. He didn't look down to find the Mary Poppins of the world who were practically perfect in every way. He did not seek to clean up our few errors, clean up the little messes that we, we left behind. He didn't do it for us. While we are beneficiaries of God's forgiveness, he did not primarily forgive us for our sake. We are not the focus of forgiveness. God forgives us out of the center of his own character as the loving and just God. We have been forgiven for his name's sake. It is that same mighty and powerful name, that character that grants us access to the Father. Those with simple faith know that they have been forgiven for His name's sake. The second thing that we know that our text tells us is that this simple faith, those with this simple faith know the Father. 
John writes to children because you know, or literally you have known, the Father. In a healthy family situation, a child knows and implicitly trusts his father. Does a child know everything about his father? I don't ever know everything about my dad from the last 10 years. No, we, but he has a relationship with him that implicitly trusts that his father will provide for and protect him. There's this implicit trust of the father. When things get difficult and life is trying, he can run to his father and find shelter and security. So it is with those with simple faith, they know that God the Father is all loving, all powerful, and all good. They may not know everything about God, but they know that they can trust the Father to provide for their every need. And when things get difficult, they run into his loving embrace, finding help in their time of need. I'd mentioned earlier that this is not, that this Samwise faith is simple and that is not simplistic. It's not one that comes easy. Coming to the point of understanding that our sins have been forgiven requires that we acknowledge that we have sins, that we know that the Father, that, and coming to know the Father requires spending time with the Father. Neither of these is easy, but neither are they complicated. A Samwise faith is simple, mature, and courageous, but it is first of all simple, recognizing the work of the Father. Next, a Samwise faith is mature, remembering God over time. John writes a nearly identical phrase here twice. He says, I am writing, and later I have written to you fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. When John refers to fathers, he could be referring to biological dads. But likely he is referring to those as a term of endearment, a term of respect, those who are mature and have had a lot of life experience. They have established life experiences and wisdom born out over time. Now, maturity is not always a reflection of chronological age. A great many people who are chronologically old are spiritually immature. And more than a few who are chronologically young exhibit tremendous spiritual maturity. Paul writes to Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. 1 Timothy 4.12. So what does a mature faith look like? I think a mature faith is exhibited in a couple of ways. First, those with mature faith demonstrate a deep knowledge of God. John writes that, they, that these fathers know him who was from the beginning. This is a relational knowledge similar to what was mentioned earlier. However, this knowledge is that which has been and has begun to plumb the depths of the character and nature of God. It is a knowledge that has searched out God and can say with the Apostle Paul, oh, the depths and of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or become his counselor or who 
has first given to him that he might be paid back again. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. As Paul writes in Romans 11. This knowledge is not casual. It does not refer to a soft understanding, but rather a deep, meaty, substantive knowledge. A mature faith seeks to know who God truly is in the truest sense of God's character. It strives to understand more than just the trivial details about God that could be put on a multiple choice or fill in the blank test. It seeks to have the deepest and most meaningful relational knowledge of God. When Karen and I got married, I knew Karen. Over time, I have learned more details. However, knowing Karen for me involves more than simply knowing details about Karen. It means giving my attention and genuinely, genuinely listening to her when she is speaking. It means learning to love her in ways that set aside my preferences for her good. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of room to grow in that area. And I think a lot, we could say that a lot all of us. However, in the same way that we exhibit mature faith, in the same way we exhibit mature faith, but giving God our full attention, we do it by giving God our full attention, by listening to Him when He speaks, and thereby reflecting back to God the love that He has poured out into our lives. Related to this deep knowledge of God, those with mature faith demonstrate a determined knowledge of God. The one with mature faith seeks to understand who God was from the beginning of time. This person also comes to understand the God who was from the beginning in his or her own life. He or she persists in pursuing God over time as God, as, as, they, as he or she has seen God work, not just providing for, but also refining this person. There is a stability to this faith because this faith has been tried in the fire and has persevered. Difficulties come, and those with this faith know this. They also remember how God has saved them through, has saved them through these difficulties in the past. In Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul describes mature faith as attaining to the measure of the stature which belongs to, to the fullness of Christ. As a result, Paul says, we are no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. A mature faith has come to know God relationally because the one with mature faith has spent time getting to know God who is the creator of time, the one who has been from the beginning. A truly deep knowledge of God cannot come about apart from spending time getting to know God through his word. When it comes to maturity, particularly maturity in faith, there is no substitute for time. A Samwise faith is simple, mature, and courageous. It is simple, recognizing the work of the Father, yet it is also mature, remembering God over time. Finally, a Samwise faith is courageous, remaining focused in the fight. 
The mission of the United States Army states in, that it is in part, quote, to deploy, fight, and win our nation's wars. Just in the past week, I watched a documentary on the battle, on the battle for Haditha Adam in Iraq in 2003. A young medic was profiled in the documentary. This young soldier discovered over the course of the battle that everyone is scared, but he learned that courage acknowledges the fear and that it keeps going anyway. In a similar sense, we are engaged in a spiritual warfare and it takes, play, and it takes the spiritual vigor and vitality often exhibited by young people. A Samwise faith is, cur is courageous, remaining focused in this spiritual fight. So what does this look like? The text tells us several things. First of all, notice that those with courageous faith exhibit godly strength. In verse 14, John states, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. Now, I don't think John is referring here to those with physical strength. More than 30 times in the Bible we find this command to be strong. And oftentimes it's paired with the command to be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Three times in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua is commanded to be strong and courageous. David writes in Psalm 27, 14, Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Those with courageous faith understand that they are strong, but they also understand that their own personal strength is not what matters. Paul writes in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might. Our strength is insufficient in ourselves. When we try to do things in our own power, we find ourselves failing because we have forgotten the Lord. This is a spiritual fight requiring spiritual resources and spiritual strength. That strength as courageous faith recognizes, is godly strength. Not only do those with courageous faith exhibit godly strength, but they are also grounded in the scriptures. John tells us, I have written to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you. The most powerful source we have at our disposal for seeking to understand the will of God is the Word of God. The prophet Jeremiah was sent by God to speak to the nation of Judah during a very rebellious time in its history. During the time when God was prophesying, God was telling the nation of Judah that they're that the end had come. Jeremiah 15, verses 15 and 16 state, this is what Jeremiah states in these verses. You know, O Lord, remember me, take notice of me, and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. Know that for your sake, I endured reproach. But then he says this in verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them. Your wor and your words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord of hosts. Those who exhibit courageous faith abide in, dwell in, and spend time in in God's word. They come to love it and it becomes their life. They learn to understand it and apply it for the purposes that God gave it. It changes them and God uses it to change others through them. 
Abiding in God's word begins to become a longing rather than a drudgery or a duty. Their appetite for the word of God becomes insatiable. God's word becomes part of who they are and how they speak. I've begun to see this in the women of this church. But men... I desire to see this in us. God has called us as men to be the spiritual protectors and providers in our home. Sure, we do this financially and perhaps we're willing to do this physically. However, when it comes to spiritual things, I feel that oftentimes we are cowards. We are the passive sons of our passive father, Adam. Men, it's way past time for us to ground ourselves in the scriptures and once again step out in courageous faith. Lastly, those with courageous faith are confident of victory. Twice John addresses young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Once again, he uses the same perfect tense verb, communicating the sense that it was done and the effects of what has been done remain or abide or continue. We experience the benefits of of a victory that has already been accomplished. The word he uses here is the word that we get, the word Nike. Nike is the Greek word for victory. The motto for the Nike shoe company has been for a long time, just do it. This is not the sense of the word in this context, however. The motivation is not for us to overcome the evil one in the sense that it has yet to be done. Rather, the evil one has been overcome. The victory has been attained. We are able to conquer because the victory has already been won. The enemy has already been defeated. We do not need to overcome the evil one since it has already been done. We experience the effects of victory now. John writes later on in this verse, in this letter, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Instead of just do it, perhaps it would be better to say, just believe it. Those with courageous faith are confident of victory because in a very real sense, the victory has already been won. A Samwise faith is simple, mature, and courageous. It is simple, recognizing the work of the Father. It is mature, remembering God over time. And it is courageous, remaining focused in the fight. As I wrap up the message this morning, and there's a, just so that you're aware, there's a video clip if we can get the sound ready for that. As I wrap up this morning, I want to show a clip from the end of the movie, The Two Towers. In this scene, Sam and Frodo find themselves in the ruined city of Osgiliath. Hope seems to be hanging by a thread. Their journey to Mount Doom to destroy the ring has been painfully difficult and they still have a long and dangerous road ahead of them. But 
in this scene, Sam makes a profound and pertinent observation. So watch this clip. We shouldn't even be here. We are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing. This shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it'll shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Furrow, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. What are we holding on to, Sam? But there's some good in this world, Mr. Furl. And it's worth fighting for. So perhaps you're struggling yourselves. Perhaps you're wrestling with, what is this? Why am I here? What am I doing? Does this all matter? What is this good that we are fighting for? Not that we are good in and of ourselves. We that we're hanging on to. Maybe you're struggling with some personal battle, wondering if you can even make it through the next day given what you're struggling with. Perhaps you're struggling with passivity. You're more willing to watch from the sidelines while the battle rages around you there's safety in the foxhole after all. And those who stick their heads up and stick their necks out are often likely to get it shut off. However, we are called to a mission that is even greater than the fictional one recounted in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. We have a mission to proclaim 
the life-giving message of the God who created humanity for a relationship with him. The God each of us has offended by our own sins and has made and this God has made a way for us to be restored. The enemy of our souls would like us to be passive, to quit, to turn back when things look difficult. Yet we must continue if we are to succeed in this mission. If we are to succeed at all, we must continue and we must continue in faith. A Samwise faith is simple. It focuses on the goodness of God. It trusts that God, as our Father, has the best in mind, even when we cannot see His hand in it. It acknowledges the work of the Father. A Samwise faith is mature. It looks back on how God has worked in the past. God has worked in the past in this church. I've heard some of the stories. I've read some of the stories. He has worked in the past. A mature faith remembers that. It is deep. A mature faith, a Samwise faith is deep and it is persistent because it has experienced God's mighty power. It remembers God's work over time. A Samwise faith is also courageous. It remembers where its strength comes from. It understands and abides in the word of God. It is confident of victory because that victory has been assured and that victory has already been accomplished. And because of that, this faith remains focused in the fight. A Samwise faith is simple, mature, and courageous. My prayer is that God would give each of us this Samwise faith. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you that we stand not on our own righteousness. We stand not on our own goodness. We stand not in our own strength. We stand because you have enabled us to stand. We stand because we are rightly assured of victory. We stand because we have a simple faith that trusts in you. We stand because we have a mature faith that has seen you work over time and has spent time in your word getting to know you. I pray for each and every one here that you would develop in us this simple, mature, and courageous faith, that it would bind us together, that we would stand together understanding the fight that we are in, but what we are called to as well. Bless this church, and may we, when the time comes, be honored to hear you say, well done, because we have been faithful in the faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.